Uh, it's a pleasure uh, for to introduce you to Sal Paratero. She is um, going to speak today, today here, here about that, that thing there. there. Uh, we will learn what it is. is. So, so uh, after her PhD in 2011, I did the first of Gaza, Gaza working, working on the theoretical analysis, analysis of the study of the electrical transmission of the electrical hormones. And then she moved in 2012. She was granted a Humboldt fellowship. And she moved to the Masmin Max Institute in 2013. And she moved to the Masmin Max Institute in Munich. Where, where she, she was, was working, working on, on control, control uh, and manipulation, manipulation of the and microagents with optical, optical features. Okay. Okay. And, and after that, she focused on her studies on, on the optical design of high efficient solution process solar cells at the Institute of Optical Sciences in Where she joined in 2014. And then she got a contract for contract. Contract. Uh, I got my original contract, and, and then she, she, she triggered a new research line of the manipulation of fascinating uh, uh, forces uh, by, by tuning the optical properties of the interacting materials in, in which she is still active today, today, as you can see. Mm -hmm. uh, since uh, 2018, she's working, working at the University of the and uh, uh, as professor and graduate doctor. doctor Designing highly efficient of electronic devices. Okay. 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 And very soon, very soon we, we will enjoy some so so she she got a permanent position in the CCC, and she will become a chief scientist very soon. So, so, so we're very very pleased that this is happening. Well, well, I want to welcome you. Thanks. Go ahead. So good morning everybody and thanks for the kind introduction, Alvaro, and Unai and Rui for inviting me today. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to control and manipulate the Casimir Lipschitz force through the uh, optical properties of the materials. So uh, this is not working. <laughs> No. Okay. So yeah, yeah, because I'm going to join this group by this institute in the coming months, I would like just to give you a short brief of my scientific career. So basically, I during these years I was uh, working on the light control at the nanoscale from different approaches. So I started my PhD on the theoretical uh, description of the extraordinary optical transmission at Universidad Universi de Zaragoza in the group of Professor Luis Martin Moreno. And then from there I joined the group of, uh, the experimental group of Professor Feldman at LNU in Munich, where I also designed uh, some systems to be controlled with uh, optical tweezers. Then I moved to the Institute of Material Science of Seville, uh, where I worked with Professor Miguel, and I started developing different uh, theoretical modeling to uh, design efficient solar cells with additional um, uh, functionalities like flexibility or a bifacial uh, performance. And then I also triggered from scratch this uh, research line in which I am still active today and I'm going to tell you a little bit today also. And then in 2018 I, I joined the group of uh, Professor Luisa Bausa at Universidad Autónoma de Madrid and where I work on the design of different systems like plasmonic nanolasers. So I'm still active in these uh, three topics and today I'm going to focus my talk on this one. So this is the outline of my talk. I will start with an introduction to the Casimir Lipschitz force, and then I will show you some examples on how to control the Casimir Lipschitz force with different photonic structures, like an optical resonator, multilayer structures, or disorder material. So uh, in 1948, Casimir uh, predicted that uh, due to quantum vacuum fluctuations, 
two metallic plates infinitely thin and perfectly conducting at zero temperature will be uh, uh, will be attracted by a force per unit area given by this expression here, where d is the separation distance between the two plates. And the rest are just universal constants. And because of this distance, distance dependence, it is important to measure it in the nano and micro scale. One way, an easy way to understand this attractive force can be uh, paying attention at the difference in the radiation pressure felt by these two plates that are forming a cavity. So we have all possible modes outside and just uh, some modes uh, that can fit inside the cavity uh, formed by these two plates. And due to that difference in the radiation pressure, these two plates are going to, to bring together. A few, a few years, years later, later uh, Lipschitz and collaborators, collaborators made an extension of this theory to uh, uh, real, real materials in the sense that the optical permittivity, the, the optical properties of the materials are not taken into account. They, they also, also made this extension to other temperatures, different from zero, and to other geometries, uh, more complex, like the sphere and the plate, or multi-layer systems and the plate, and so on. But, but one, one of the, the most, most interesting results of this extension <coughs> is the prediction of repulsive Casimir forces in contrast to this uh, original idea. Because it has a lot of uh, technological applications and implications in the so-called nano and micro electromechanical devices, which uh, form part of some of the devices that we use in our everyday. Uh, this attractive force is at the heart of the malfunctioning of these devices when some of the component parts stick together or because of friction and so on. Uh, but it has also inspired uh, biomaterials, it also plays a role in microfluidics or drug delivery among other topics. And um, because I don't know the, the the background of uh, this audience. I would like to give a short, uh, to give a short timeline. The, the literature is super extensive and um, I, I cannot cover it. But just to give you an idea of how complicated it was to prove experimentally the, the existence of this, of this world. So around the 50s, we have uh, the prediction of Casimir and the Lipschitz extension. And then during the next years, there were some uh, experimental attempts trying to measure these attractive forces. But because of the technological needs and the nanoscale distances and everything, there was nothing really taken as a real proof. Uh, it was not until near 2000 because of the technological progress, there were, there were more accurate measurements of these attractive forces, and it is the experiment by Lamoureux in 2002 between a sphere and a plate that is considered like the, the first real evidence of this, uh, uh, of this force. Actually, it was in 2005 by the group of Ricardo Deca and collaborators the, the, it happened that this is like decided to be the experiment, like the most accurate one, uh, again in the in the geometry of the sphere and the plate. And then in 2009, a group of Capasso and collaborators uh, demonstrated experimentally for the first time the existence of repulsive Cassini forces. So we are talking about 2009 since uh, this prediction. Again, Again, in the sphere and the plane geometry, uh, there are, why, why did it happen like that? So apart from the technological needs, uh, we also have the presence of other uh, uh, forces like the double layer force or electrostatic force that can mask, is comparable in, in, in intensity to this force. We also have uh, issues with the rugosity of the samples and we also have the option to have patch potentials which are like uh, <coughs> electrostatic uh, profiles of, of, uh, of electrostatic, well, yeah, it's like a, uh, an electrostatic profile occurring at the interface of this material. But anyway, uh, since the description, there has been a lot of work uh, from the theoretical and experimental point of view, trying to tune and manipulate and control this force, uh, playing with the geometry, with the use of metamaterials, also modifying the optical properties, with nanostructuration, using phase change materials, also trying to manipulate the, the magnetic properties. 
and more uh, recently with the use of superconducting materials, 2D materials, and exigon near zero materials. And that in the last four years, there's been a novel approach for uh, measuring uh, repulsive Cosmic forces in the plane plane geometry. And this is interesting because this is the, the geometry where the intense is the highest in comparison to the sphere and the plate, the sphere and the sphere, and so on. And of course, it has not been demonstrated uh, before. Most of, the, most of the issues have to deal with the alignment, actually, of the, of the fields. Okay? And uh, this work. Um, are based, based on, on the, the quantum, quantum trapping of a plate, uh, of a metallic plate. So, so these are theoretical proposals, proposals and, and there are experiments. Uh, they, they, they are all based in the, in the, in the, in this idea. idea. So, so we are going, going to have an optical resonator formed by two plates in which one of the plates is levitating or is trapped over the other in a fluid due to the action of Cassini and Lipschitz forces and other forces. Okay, so, so the idea is that you can um, characterize spectroscopically your system, your optical resonator, and from here you can deduce the equilibrium position or the equilibrium distance, and we know that the Cassini force depends on the, on the separation distance between the two objects that are um, uh, interacting. So, so these are the experiments and the theory ideas, ideas and then, and then there, there were some extensions to considering uh, phase change materials, including asynchronic uh, materials in the, inside this optical resonator and entering the, um, the strong coupling regime, actually. And then there's been some new uh, works also playing around with the diffusion. So the way I see it is like here we have a new platform for exploring physics at the Nanoscale. It's similar to an optical tweezer in the sense that you are trapping an object in the, in the absence of a substrate. But actually here we can also extend uh, this, this um, technique to the plane, right? Because in the optical tweezers you are there, you can just work in, along this uh, direction. But then now here we can have uh, new options with this, with this approach. So uh, until, until this works, what, what was usually employed was this uh, technique here, where we have a cantilever, we have a sphere and a plate, and, and just by seeing the deflection of the tip, we can observe the attractive uh, force, or we can just observe the uh, repulsive force. In this other case, um, we have a novel approach where we are going to demonstrate from uh, far field measurements this quantum effect. Okay. So, how do we get this quantum trapping? Because we are saying that we have an optical resonator where one of the mirrors levitates over the other, right? So, we can, uh, we will have quantum trapping whenever all the forces acting on this field uh, are balanced. So, in this example here, I'm just considering Cassini Lipschitz forces, gravity, and buoyancy because all these systems are in a fluid different from vacuum. So we can have a scheme like this, where we have an attractive, it's okay, an attractive uh, Cassini force acting at short separation distances. This is the total force uh, as a function of the separation distance that changes to be repulsive at long separation distances. Here, anytime these forces cancel, we are going to trap our object. We can have the opposite uh, situation where we have repulsive Casimir forces at short separation change, uh, uh, distances that change to be attractive at longer one. And any time we have a balance of all the forces, then we have uh, this quantum trapping situation. The difference between the two systems is that in this case we have an unstable equilibrium position and here this is a stable, meaning that here any, any deviation from that position will make the film either float or sink, whereas in this other case, we are going to have all these forces pointing to that equilibrium position. So we are basically interested in, in this kind of situations because it's going to be more stable and we can do uh, many more things. Um, so how can we get a repulsive force in a plane parallel geometry? 
It is, it is not, not easy. easy. Uh, there, there is this uh, condition, condition in the equation that, that the dielectric function of the substrate, the fluid, and the other material need to be fulfilled over a wide uh, frequency range. Um, this is a necessary condition, but it is not enough. So you, you just need to play a little. There is not another condition that if you have two conditions, then you are always going to have this repository. No, this is a condition that must be satisfied over a wide frequency range, but it is not for sure that it's going to happen. So um, also here we need to, well, some things just to check very fast. If we have vacuum, sorry. If we have vacuum, we are always going to have an attractive force. If we have two uh, similar materials made of the same material, we are always going to have an attractive force. Okay, so we need a material if we want to use standard materials, let's say. Right? So if we want to have a repulsive cosmic force, we need the similar materials and a few different from vacuum okay, in our design. And another thing to, to check is that these frequencies are the so-called Matsubara frequencies in which we are going to rotate from the uh, um, real axis to the complex plane, just by doing this weak rotation, where we are going to integrate over an infinite um, range of frequencies the losses of our materials. So we can see already here another problem, which is that we don't always know the refractive index or the permittivity of the materials in an infinite uh, spectral range of wavelengths. So for our designs, we we always try to think about materials or, or systems that can be fabricated experimentally. So uh, this is going to um, to limit the the, the 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 kind of materials that we can use in our in our uh, experiments. Also, by doing this weak rotation, we are going to avoid rapid oscillations in the integral when calculating the force, and this can be avoided by doing this rotation. Okay. Uh, the thing is that once we play with this rotation, any kind of intuition we can have about the material due to their optical properties is somehow lost, because here I'm showing you the complex part of the uh, refractive index as a function of the frequency, and here is the, the um, transformation to matter frequencies. So anytime we have an absorption, there's going to be an increment of the slope in this, in this curve, and anytime we have a transparency, we have a planar band here. Okay, so we are going to check that in equ in equation that I showed you before in this kind this kind of plot. Okay, for our design especially. How do we calculate the Cassini imports for uh, multilayer skin? So we have any uh, general multilayer system where we have an object, then we have another object. It can be just one film or by layer, multilayer, whatever, all immersed in a fluid. So, so the Cassini force, force per unit area at a finite temperature <coughs> is given by <laughs> this expression here. And it, well, it could be more or less complicated, but we can identify here the multiple Fresnel coefficients of the bottom and the top surfaces of, of in, in this uh, fluid, which in turn depend on the simple Fresnel coefficients. And this is where the permittivity of our materials is entering the, the equation. Okay. Exactly. We are going to uh, uh, to skip them just by playing with the uh, separation distances of our systems in the around one micron. Uh, so, uh, yeah, around one micron in distance is everything should be fine. But in any case, um, yeah, usually we are always far from the thermal uh, fluctuations, but we can. Why do I say that this is a quantum response function? 
Yeah, yeah, because, because the, the description by Lipschitz is done like that, that from an electromagnetic. No, it is not obvious. Nothing. Once you have real materials, for me, it is not obvious how to explain all these things. Yeah, like that. Sorry. The one half is not uh, uh, yeah, exactly here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. No, here, yeah, with these uh, um, equations, it's also when you are in the Matsuhara uh, frequency, it's, it's even more complicated. So, actually, we were working with four equations, one from a finite temperature, one at zero temperature, in the Matsuhara frequency range, or with real or normal frequencies. So, and then you, you lose the, sorry. It is not here, but I believe it is here. Maybe there's a typo, but I don't think so. I believe it enters here with these frequencies. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so with this, uh, <coughs> what we try to do, because we uh, now know that uh, this force depends on the optical properties of the materials, and this was triggered at the Institute of Material Science of Seville, where uh, we had some experience on optical resonators, building multilayer structures, or composite materials, and these are just some examples of uh, cross-section of some of the samples we could fabricate for other purposes, like uh, solar, solar cells, cells providing, providing them, them with color, or uh, solar cells, flexible solar cells, cells uh, that, that are flexible, flexible as well. So, so with these ideas, ideas in mind, we said, okay, we can modify the optical properties of our materials. materials. Can we tune? Can we do something interesting uh, on this Cassini uh, leaf sheets for? So I'm going to try to show you. I don't have uh, here. Okay. So I will start with the optical resonator uh, project. So, so, as you, you all know, an optical resonator is, is just composed by two mirrors, mirrors that can have trap light. light. So, so light, light inside the two mirrors can reflect several times, and then you have this typical reflectance spectrum where we have these narrow features whose uh, um, resonant wavelength is given by this expression here, which depends upon the um, refractive index in between the two mirrors, the separation distance between the two mirrors, and then the order of magnitude, and uh, the order of the, 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 the diffraction and, and the incidence of light. Right? Okay. So, uh, as I said before, this is the, the idea is the following. So we have this system that is going to we are going to build an optical resonator where one of the films is levitating over the other. So we are going to characterize it spectroscopically. We are going to have something like that. And from this kind of uh, measurement and from some fittings, we can extract the uh, equilibrium distance of our system. And then by changing the, uh, the refractive index, the, the um, like layering differently in between the two mirrors, we can tune this equilibrium distance and build different um, uh, optical resonators. Okay. So we need uh, to fulfill several conditions in our design. We want to have, as I told you before, repulsive Casimir forces to have something that is stable. We need to have sharp spectral features so that we have accurate results. We want them to occur in the optical range. We need, we need to have, have well-known materials, materials because of this integral that I told you and because we want to handle it in the lab. Uh, uh, sorry. sorry. We, we want, want it to be experimentally feasible. We want, we want to work at the nano and micro scale and we want it to be also stable in time. And for this reason, we avoided uh, uh, alcohols uh, as the fluids mediating this interaction. Although 
these are typical materials that really give you um, repulsive scattering forces. So the final design is something like this. We have a gold substrate covered with a thin layer of silica, on top of which we have this bilayer of polystyrene and gold, all immersed in glycerol. So uh, here we could see that this uh, permittivity is well filled in the equation that I told you before. And when we have a look at the force acting on this system for this set of parameters as a function of the separation distance, in logarithm scale, we can observe that we have a repulsive component and short separation distances that changes to be attractive at longer ones. And when we have this zero force, we have this minimum, and this corresponds to the equilibrium distance. So the use of the signal only to tune the distance? Yeah, actually, like that. <laughs> And these two curves correspond just to the Casimir force and also when we included gravity and buoyancy. We also analyzed the effect of uh, the, the presence of the possible of having electrostatic forces and we evaluated through the uh, Poisson-Boltzmann methodology the effect of including uh, monovalent salts. Whenever we have uh, low concentration, we have an additional uh, repulsive um, and a component, but, but when, when we increase the, 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 the concentration, concentration, then we really cancel any electrostatic uh, <coughs> component. So, so from, from now, now on, we are just going, going to assume that we are including enough salt in our, our glycerol. The optical properties are not going to be modified, and, and, and this is the analysis we did for, for that. Okay, so, um, so now we said, okay, can we can we do something with these uh, optical resonators? So we try to tune and modify the distance in between the, the, the two mirrors by either changing the thickness of the gold film, the polystyrene, or the silica film. And this corresponds, these are the three cases, okay? And in all cases, we could uh, tune the, 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 the equilibrium distance from several tens of nanometers to several hundreds of uh, nanometers. How does the, the reflectance spectra of this system look like? They look like something that we wanted to have, actually. So this is the, the reflectance of uh, silica films of 100, 100, and 600 nanometers. They have very uh, low Q factors, but still enough Q factors to be accurate in the measurement of these cavity sizes, as I'm going to show you now. So uh, in this case, these two, with these two examples, I just want to to show you uh, that we need to have high enough uh, quality factors in our optical resonators, uh, about 150, which is uh, something easy to have. But just to have you uh, to give you an idea of what could happen, this is the reflectance of a system uh, at equilibrium. And it is displayed with this gray line here, and it is thick because I'm considering a 5% error that could arise from some misalignment, rugosity, or some experimental uh, issue. Whereas these two other systems are out of equilibrium. These are just systems, uh, like a picture of it, and these are out of equilibrium. These two cases lie inside the gray curve, meaning that I could not distinguish a system in equilibrium from those out of equilibrium. Whereas in this other case, uh, we have another two systems out of equilibrium. This is at equilibrium, the quality factor is around this, and then we can distinguish this minimum here from these two others. Why is this important? Because the way we are going to extract the information is just by a fitting with a multi-layer uh, transfer matrix method, and then we are going to extract the, the thicknesses of the material. Yeah. Yeah, the thickness of the polystyrene uh, layer is important for the buoyancy. Because you have a gallery of items, you can nearly make the load without any extra forces. Exactly, we were playing with that. So the, in, within the design, we needed to make sure that we were not just observing some floating effect or something like that. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, very briefly, because we didn't succeed. Here. Because the equilibrium distance only depends on the refractive index of the two materials. So if you increase the quality factor, then you can increase the quality factor. Yeah, so if you increase the silica thickness, you are not 
or modifying the security of these tools. Is that true? So, so the only way that the previous step depends only on the attack abilities. So if you put two materials together, if this fits at all, the equilibrium distance is always the same. So the only way to change this distance is by Casimir Force. Casimir Force has this idea. Yes. Okay. Because when you, exactly, because it has like, like a, the reach of the interaction is different and then you start seeing the next material and so on. Okay. So, I will go very fast because we, it didn't work out. Okay, tell me. What happens with the Van der Waal course? It's uh, the same. It's, uh, it's the, the limit. It's the same, actually, so it is the limit at very short distances where you, when you don't take into account Retardation effect. So, we were sure a Casimir port or a Van der Waal port? Casimir port. Because we are at a uh, larger distance. When you have to include a uh, uh, retardation effect. So, the Van der Waals here is around uh, maybe two. I cannot remember that when people did a lot atomic core microscope. And they were kind of blue and one silica particle in the microscope and they have a silica surface and they were approaching <coughs> one each other and they were using the diagonal and the mandaber property and they always have a contribution of electrostatic and bandwidth. <coughs> and the balls, and I remember it was around that distance. Mm, I don't think so, because this is, it's the same theory. I mean, if you take the limit of the theory, then you go from one, yeah, you get it. It's the same theory. Yeah, because the, the, the origin is the same. Quantum vacuum fluctuation. That's a good <laughs> Dispersion forces in general. Um, just here to, to show you that we were working on uh, well fabricating the polystyrene layer and then check the optical quality of gold. We could fabricate our freestanding system with high quality optical quality. Then we checked uh, or we fabricated two different substrates, not just the gold one, and, but the silicon one also, a silicon wafer with silica and, and here the same. So we can check the optical quality, check the size of our sample. So we really wanted to observe macroscopically a quantum effect. We built the whole system without glycerol. This is how it looks like, the polyesterine gold, silica gold glass. We measured, uh, well, characterized it uh, spectroscopically. We did the fitting, everything was fine. But then we included glycerol and our sample started to roll up. And, and we had, had to deal to with this for a long time. time. Probably we, we believed that we had some mechanical <coughs> stress in between the polystyrene and the gold. We played different solutions. But in the end, uh, we were always, so this is what we measured, this is what we fitted, and this corresponds to one order of magnitude larger than what we expected from our design. So our design was done for something like this, and this is what we were measuring. We also checked um, uh, the effect of electrostatic forces and so on, and when we were, when we were dealing with this, and then it happens. No? As it happens many times in, sci in, in, in science, something did the same, uh, but better and, and faster. So in the group of Xi'an Sang in, in Berkeley, at the same time, they presented the, this work that has some differences in comparison with our uh, approach. So they have now gold and Teflon. Everything is immersed in ethanol, and they have a gold flake here. And the thing is that they are considering uh, alcohol that we uh, neglected because of the stability issues. And then they have this micron size plates, which are not running up in anything. And then they did the same, they just measured the reflectance, and then by changing the Teflon thickness, they were tuning. Um, so we had a nice idea, but uh, just like that. <laughs> Uh, because, because this is an informal seminar, I also wanted to show the results that we never had the chance to show. And why is the ethanol not a problem? For them? Because of the I believe that probably this is uh, in, a, in some chamber or something like that. We, we were just working with... Silica is different to silica because silica is reactive, but ethanol is not reactive. Do you think that there is? The... 
with uh, with uh, alcohol that does not form any bone <coughs> or silica it can form but kind of bones with uh, with with uh, with, with glycerol uh, uh, not, not sure, sure. Actually, actually that one we excluded it because in the literature it was said that there are um, carboxyl groups that can be attached very easily and that can uh, arise, give rise to higher electrostatic uh, forces. <coughs> okay. And I just want to highlight your previous transparency for the sake of all experimentalists who work very, very hard. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to draw an applause there. <laughs> so they are dropping the plate with an optical twister. No, no, no. It is not an optical twister. Ah, yeah, yeah. How to trap means that they are not just by casting new forces. They change because you change the table. Exactly. The they also uh, probably, I don't know if they excluded, so they, if they work with salt or something. Trap means that the plate is always in the same position. Along the set axis, yeah. Are not showing the x y or no? No, not necessarily. No, no. Because this is a two D. Yeah, actually, if you make that at the beginning when we started, it was sailing. Our sample was sailing because it was not properly balanced. So. Now, uh, I don't know these results, but at uh, first sight, I see that the trapping distance from 60 degrees to 100, and then the trapping distance from 30 to 60 degrees, which is 40 nanometers. That, that, that doesn't happen because the mirror is being shifted. Yeah. I will not uh, tell you my. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it worked. I mean, it really worked, and there are three more, uh, actually, two more papers based on the same idea, and, and it's working. And I've seen, uh, I've seen in the talks, uh, by, not by Jian San. This I didn't see any talk by the group by Timur Shegai. He did the next two nice works on nature. And, and you can see in the, I don't know if this is in the supporting information, but in the talks, you can see um, dark, field, uh, dark field microscope videos where you can see when the flake is, is still tilting because of some uh, electrostatic forces until they really fix it and you have the, that really nice color of an optical resonator there. So Could this experiment be done by changing, mixing a different liquid and changing the electric uh, properties? Of Probably, the yes. We, we want Victoria to come back from her PhD, <laughs> from her postdoc to start. Yeah. <laughs> because we were just three, Victoria and I, and it's, it's, it's complex to fight here, you know? It's very tricky. Anyways, we, th these were our first attempts, so I think it's, uh, it's nice, and we are still uh, working on that. So this is how, just to complete, right? So I told you we had this idea, and then these two other um, uh, father papers, this is from this year, I think, or last year, uh, very late. Okay, uh, <laughs> let's see how much I can tell you now from these multi-layer structures and composite materials. So uh, we said, okay, can we tune this force uh, by modifying the optical properties <coughs> of demand, no, with these uh, one-dimensional photonic crystals or these uh, composite materials? Uh, comprising several materials, so the idea is that if we can change the losses of the material, then we should be able to change and tune the, the casting force, okay? <laughs> so we know that uh, in a multi-layer structure, we are going to have this periodicity in the refractive index of alternating materials, and this is uh, something nice to do because we can have uh, nanometric control on the thickness of these materials. Uh, we can uh, uh, fabricate uh, large areas also in a flexible or, or self-standing um, uh, version and we can deposit dielectric materials both in the dense or uh, porous uh, version okay so by playing with the layer thickness in this uh, one dimensional photonic uh, crystal where we are going to have uh, forbidden uh, band gaps 
for the bangers, uh, we can tune the, the position of this uh, rack peak with the layer thickness, and we can also play with the intensity of the of the peak with the number of layers. So we, our first work was on the description of uh, quantum trapping of thin films made of Teflon. So we, this is originally our, our system, Teflon, silica, and polystyrene, and we observed that silica and polystyrene, well, maybe better here, silica and polystyrene present forces of opposite nature and similar intensity. So uh, here, we, this is for silica, this is for uh, polystyrene, we thought, okay, what happens if we change, if we combine these two materials? So uh, we did this analysis of the reflectance response as a function of the wavelength for thin and thick uh, films for 2 and 16 bilayers, and a bilayer is silica and polystyrene, something like this, two skins. And here we can observe, for the case of the thick uh, films, the brack peak, whereas here, where the brack uh, peak for thin films should appear, nothing happened. So this is related to the fact that the silica and polystyrene, both materials absorb a lot in that spectral range where we should expect to have the, the brack peak. And when, and when we, we compute, compute the Cassini force as a function of the separation distance, we observe that the response is modulated by that of uh, silica in bulk and polystyrene. So we have this kind of uh, uh, figure, uh, shape here. And then we, we observe that for thick fields, nothing really happens, although we are observing uh, very different uh, optical properties. And for the thin fields, Something happens, but not so much. And actually here we do not see anything, but of course it makes sense, right? Because the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which gives us the force, says that it is uh, um, proportional to the losses. So here our material is transparent, we can do what, whatever, that we are not going to affect the absorption losses of our material. Okay, so we then, we said, okay, we need to change the optical, the, the absorption properties of our materials, but we cannot consider anything like that because the more amount of material, the more absorbing material. So what we did was just to fix the thickness, a final thickness, total thickness of 40 nanometers, made of silica and polystyrene in a 50%, and we arranged the material differently, which means that we are making the thickness uh, thinner. And with this, we really could uh, tune the Cassini force as a function of the separation distance. Again, we have the same shape, and as you can see here, uh, it is nice because with the same amount of material, but um, arranged differently, you can tune your system to have either a positive force, which is a, a repulsive force, you can cancel it, or you can have it negative, which is an attractive. So by uh, playing with the non-structuration of the material, you can really uh, manipulate the force. It's uh, somewhat strange to me that you never mentioned the local density of states, which seems a very uh, relevant concept here because uh, the force of course in a region where they you are enhancing in some states or enhancing them or so you, you never involve this not like that um i what we checked was actually the the effect of interference effect which is shown here but just lead to a modification of the uh, and uh, um, you are right. Uh, we, I've been talking to the people in in the community for for some time now because I also had this feeling like does the 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 because in the end what I use is that expression that I showed you before. Like how does it take into account all these things? Transparency is a uh, sort of uh, hard way to explain what, what the origin of Cassini forces is, because you don't have modes, you don't have more outside, outside than inside, mm. and this is sort of the density of space. Yes. So why nobody took that route? 
Um, as far as I know, like some, no, no, probably not. They are, so there are different approaches to get to the same expression. This is for sure. But I don't know if this is uh, from the, uh, the local density of the states. I don't know. Probably there is because there are many formulations, many, many, many. The scattering uh, matrix uh, model, many, 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 many. many. Uh, but I don't know the whole literature because it's so expensive. But thank you. <laughs> uh, I think I'm super tired now. But <laughs> Um, just very fast, what we wanted to prove was just to have a look what was going on with the absorption actually in this film. So these are the, this is the cross section, a profile for bulk uh, silica and polystyrene and we can observe this is the, the um, differential absorption and this is where the silica absorbs, this is where the polystyrene absorbs and then due to the interference effects these hotspots uh, are interchanging here. And if we compute the absorption of the whole film in black here, we can observe that we are uh, really changing and modifying the, the absorption uh, properties of our system, right? So we are changing this and in a way what we are doing, although we didn't uh, evaluate it, um, is to change, so moving from the, this is silica, this is polystyrene, and this is glycerol. So we are tuning our uh, permittivity in this range here, and this is the reason why, why we can really tune the uh, calcium deficits for. So effectively, we are changing something there. And here I will be very brief already. So another strategy is to combine uh, two materials by considering a homogeneous film in which we include uh, different inclusions. The main difference in between the two is that because of the inclusions, now we are going to have uh, diffuse uh, components of the light. Before our analysis, there had been some work trying to check how the Cassini force can be uh, manipulated uh, uh, by playing with effective medium models, okay, that are not taking into account um, single resonances of the nanoparticles. So we have a lot of different uh, effective medium approximations and different effective medium approximations for the same system provide uh, give uh, different results. So we said, okay, we have a way to, um, to, to describe the optical properties of an inhomogeneous system where we have an approach where we combine in, a, in Monte Carlo, mean scattering theory and Fresno coefficients. So basically we send a lot of photons to our system, follow them, and then we can have the absorption of all materials inside the system, the, the diffused components and so on and so forth. This is something that we have uh, extensively used for um, solar cells here, uh, bifacial or, or flexible, but very recently also to extract the, uh, the nanostructure, the internal nanostructure of a porous TiO2 film, for instance, by combining this with a genetic algorithm and so on. But I'm not going to give the details here, and, but it is an, Employee. <laughs> so how do we do it? So basically, we consider a one micron film thickness of silica with polystyrene inclusions of 10%, for instance, and we change the radius of our system, and we compute the absorption of our system. Okay. And now we say, okay, how would it be the permittivity of a system that is homogeneous, and this meet this response? Is it, is it clear? So I send all my photons to do all the things and then I have uh, these properties where I'm taking into account my theory and so on. And now I say, okay, I want to know through with a, a, a genetic algorithm, if I have just a homogeneous system with this response, how is the effective permittivity there? And, and this is what we did, this is what our fitting. And we did uh, many things, we analyzed this is spectral region where the absorption is the same. We also analyze what happens here. 
So if you don't mind, I'm already very tired. So I, I go to the point. Um, so we did that. We did this speeding. We obtained an effective uh, permittivity. We did our quick rotation. And then this is what we observed. So if you consider a, an effective medium approximation for a one micron film thickness with this amount of spheres, this is what we get for acidic and polystyrene, and this is fixed. But if we consider the size of our particles, then we get uh, these different um, uh, equilibrium positions when the particle is really taken into account in the model. And we, well, this is the kind of uh, curves that we analyze, and we do the same by just by changing the, the concentration of the sphere. With this I'm done, I would also like to, to say a few things that that this force is present in many, many uh, areas, fields and topics, and we are also working with a very large international collaboration with, in IT systems and the surface pre-melting that has strong implications in geophysics and astrogeophysics. This is something that we are also working on. We just, I leave it there. <laughs> and with this, I would like to just to conclude. I think that I show you how it is possible with three different photonic structures to uh, play a little bit and manipulate the optical properties and then the casting force uh, with these three examples here. And, and this is the team, Hernan and Victoria. And, and this is it. And thank you for your attention.